Coming up on Astronomy Toronto, we will preview four space events scheduled for 1989. Unmanned missions to Venus and Jupiter will be launched. Neptune will be visited by Voyager, and the space shuttle will deploy a large telescope in Earth orbit, making this year a year of recovery for the American space program. Welcome to Astronomy Toronto. I'm your host. My name is Randy Atwood. Astronomy Toronto is Southern Ontario's quarterly astronomical news magazine seen here on Rogers Cable 10 and is produced by the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Well, today Astronomy Toronto comes to you from the Astro Centre at the McLaughlin Planetarium here at the Royal Ontario Museum. On today's show, we'll have some news items with Tim Turnbull, and Michael Watson will tell us what to look for in the night sky this spring. We'll then look at the recovery of NASA's space program. In 1989, NASA plans to launch seven space shuttle missions. Two of these will send unmanned space probes to the planets Venus and Jupiter, and a third will place a spectacular new telescope in Earth orbit. We'll see how 1989 will be a comeback year in astronomy and space sciences later in the hour. But first, let's return to the studio with Tim Turnbull, who has some current news items. Tim? Thank you, Randy. This August, the Voyager 2 spacecraft will give us our first close-up views of the planet Neptune and its moons. In this computer-generated film, we fly with Voyager as it passes over Neptune's North Pole and then swings by the moon Triton. Voyager 2 has become the most successful unmanned space probe, having been launched 12 years ago. Neptune will be its fourth and last planetary encounter. Randy will have more on the Voyager-Neptune encounter later in the show. Toronto's own IMAX camera system flew on the Discovery Space Shuttle mission last March. This is the fifth time that the camera has been in space. A new IMAX film called The Blue Planet is in production. It's due to be released in 1990. The Dream is Alive was the first motion picture taken in space by astronauts, and it played for many months in the Cinesphere at Ontario Place. For the first time, the IMAX film format gives viewers a sense of what it's really like to fly in space. The Discovery crew spent many hours in Houston training with an IMAX camera. They shot views of the Johnson Space Center and had their efforts reviewed by IMAX representatives. Future IMAX films may be shot from the Soviet space station Mir in conjunction with the International Geophysical Year in 1992. Canada's newest space agency is working on its biggest project for the next number of years, designing and building the International Space Station's mobile servicing system. Canada formalized the agreement to contribute this element in a signing ceremony in Washington last fall. The United States leads the project, with Japan and Europe as other contributing partners. The Canadian system includes a base structure that will be mounted on a U.S.-supplied transporter, an advanced robot arm, which is stronger and more sophisticated than the Canada arm, a special-purpose dexterous manipulator, a maintenance depot, and the controls and testing systems needed to develop and operate everything. Canada's aerospace industry will have to design and implement advanced technologies, including artificial intelligence and robotics, to make the entire system work. The Mobile Servicing System, or MSS, is a crucial part of the space station program. Present plans call for it to be launched on the second space station assembly mission, where it will be the main means of assembling the huge station. It will ride along a truss structure, which is the station's backbone, and maneuver the various modules and payloads into space. This contribution will entitle Canada to perform scientific and engineering experiments on board the orbiting lab. This will include flights of Canadian astronauts who will spend about six months aboard the space station every two years. The prime contractor, Spar Aerospace of Toronto, 
is working through a complex preliminary design process with its supporting contractors around Canada and with NASA prime contractors in the U.S. A preliminary design may be agreed upon by this spring or summer with a final design fixed about two years later. Present plans call for the first space station element to be launched in 1995. It should be operational by 1996 and its first phase completed by 1998. Canada will have its second astronaut in space on the International Microgravity Lab shuttle flight, which is planned for early 1991. Dr. Roberta Bondar and Dr. Ken Money have been chosen to train for the flight aboard the space shuttle Columbia. NASA will select one of the two Canadian astronauts to fly while the other serves as a backup. The mission's experiments will consist of life sciences and materials processing in microgravity using the European-built Space Lab module. Experiments will be performed to try to determine why some astronauts get sick in space. The Solar Maximum Mission Satellite, launched in 1980 and rescued and repaired by the 11th shuttle mission in 1984, is in danger of re-entering the atmosphere and being destroyed. An unexpected expansion of the extremely thin upper air layer has been dragging the satellite to a dangerously lowered orbit and premature destruction. Designed to observe the sun, SolarMax has provided scientists with invaluable data about our nearest star. Another shuttle visit to boost the satellite was hoped for, but NASA could not plan a rescue mission to fit in with the busy shuttle schedule. Solar Max could re-enter as early as January 1990. When we return, Michael Watson will preview the night sky this spring. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Welcome to the Night Sky this season, a regular feature of Astronomy Toronto that we inaugurated with our last show. Tonight we bring you the stars of spring. Springtime is a season of lengthening days and shorter nights as the sun moves higher in the sky and more northerly and eventually from the equinox in March it arrives at the summer solstice for northern hemisphere observers this year on June 21st. That's Wednesday, June 21st at 5.53 a.m. and that's Eastern Daylight Time. So mark that day on your calendars. It is the longest day of the year and the shortest night of the year for observers. But before we tell you about the events to be seen in the skies over Toronto this spring, let's take a look back at something that we talked about in our previous show, and that was the occultation of the star Regulus by the Moon that took place on Monday, January 23rd of this year. 
those people who uh, saw the show last time may recall that we talked about the occultation of Regulus. The occultation of Regulus occurred when the moon moved across the star and the star suddenly reappeared from behind the dark limb of the moon. As it turned out, Monday the 23rd of January was uh, a, a night of spectacularly clear skies and many observers in Toronto observed the occultation of Regulus. Uh, our host Randy Atwood managed to capture the event on videotape and several of us also photographed the event and the photographs that I'm about to show you were taken through this telescope here. On January 23rd, the moon was just past full. In this short 125th second exposure through the telescope, you can see the various seas and highlands on the moon's surface and the craters on the right edge. The moon was moving through the sky from right to left, covering the bright star Regulus. Because the moon has a much greater surface brightness than does the star Regulus, a much longer exposure is required to show the star. Here we see the star just as it has emerged from behind the dark limb of the moon, moments after the occultation. This was a very exciting event and one that is extremely rare from any one location on the Earth's surface. There are several events to see in the night skies over Toronto between the equinox and the solstice. The springtime is a particularly good time to see the phenomenon of Earthshine on the moon, also known as the old moon in the new moon's arms. You may have wondered from time to time when looking at the waxing crescent moon in the evening sky why it is that in addition to the very brilliantly illuminated crescent of the moon, you can also see very faintly illuminated the rest of the moon. That illumination is caused by sunlight reflected off the bright surface of the Earth back onto the moon and then into your eye. And this is the phenomenon known as Earthshine. We have a couple of diagrams to demonstrate the geometry associated with Earthshine and also a photograph of Earthshine on the moon taken through a telescope. Our first diagram shows the moon's orbit around the Earth with the sun off the screen to the right. When the moon is in its new phase, an observer located on the Earth looking toward it can see no portion of the moon illuminated. Two weeks later, when the moon has moved around its orbit to be on the opposite side of the Earth, the observer on the Earth looking toward the moon sees the entire bright disk illuminated. Halfway in between during first quarter, the observer on the Earth can see half of the uh, side of the moon facing the Earth illuminated. It is in that portion of the moon's orbit between new and first quarter when the moon is a waxing crescent, that Earthshine can best be seen. When the moon is in the crescent phase, an observer situated on the Earth can see a very thin, brightly illuminated crescent off to the right with the sun off the screen on the right side. The rest of the moon, depicted in black here, is in darkness, but it is this portion when the moon is in the crescent phase that can often be seen faintly illuminated by Earthshine. Earthshine can also be seen when the moon is in its waning crescent phase. This photograph, taken through the telescope in the spring of 1988, shows the bright illuminated portion of the moon burnt in to the left side and faint Earthshine on the right. This spring, the new moon occurs very early in the months of April and May, and therefore the best time to see Earthshine, which is a few days after new moon, are between the following dates. In April, between the 9th and the 13th of the month, and in May, one month later, between the 8th and the 12th. So be watching during those periods. It'll be your best chance of the year to see Earthshine. You may have noticed during the course of the winter that the brilliant white planet Jupiter was dominating the evening sky. The spring is also a very good time to see certain of the planets, and as spring wears on, Jupiter sinks lower and lower into the western sky immediately after sunset. On the evenings of Saturday and Sunday, the 9th and 10th of April, the waxing crescent moon joins Jupiter in the evening sky. We have a diagram to show what this very interesting conjunction of Jupiter and the moon will look like. As the sky darkens during twilight after sunset on the evenings of the 9th and 10th of April, the brilliant planet Jupiter will stand in the western sky about 25 degrees high. To its upper left will be the fainter reddish planet Mars. Joining these two planets on the evening of Saturday the 9th of April will be the waxing crescent moon just to the right of the planet Jupiter. The following evening, the moon will appear between the two planets, Jupiter and Mars, making for a very pretty conjunction that can be observed and photographed very easily. So mark your sky calendars for the 9th and 10th of April to see the waxing crescent moon with the planets Jupiter and Mars in the evening sky. 
This spring is also a very good time to see the most elusive and difficult to observe of all of the planets, and that is the planet Mercury. Mercury is so difficult to observe from the Earth because it is much closer to the Sun than is the Earth and follows a very tight orbit around the Sun. As a result, when Mercury is visible in the evening sky, it never strays very far from the Sun and sets within an hour or two after the Sun. When it's visible in the morning sky, it rises no more than an hour or two before the Sun. In the last week of April and the first few days of May, Mercury makes its best appearance of the year for Northern Hemisphere observers. We have a diagram to show where Mercury will be seen in the western sky within a few minutes after sunset. Although Mercury will be visible for about a 10-day period toward the end of April and the first few days of May, this diagram shows what the evening sky will look like at about 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the evening of Monday, the 1st of May. Mercury will stand about 10 degrees above the western horizon in the gathering twilight, and the brilliant planet Jupiter will appear to the upper left. Indeed, Jupiter, which will appear before Mercury as the brighter planet, will be a good guide to the elusive Mercury. Spotting Mercury in the evening sky this spring will require some skill and some real patience. Experienced observers say that the best way to observe Mercury, and indeed many of the stars and planets, is to use a pair of binoculars. Binoculars have the great advantage of being very portable. They show wide fields of view, and they show the stars and planets uh, in extremely sharply. The best way then to see the planet Mercury is to uh, find a nice uh, low western horizon and go at about 20 minutes or so after sunset. Starting at about that time, take the binoculars near the uh, horizon and sweep back and forth gaining an altitude a little bit each time. At some point over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, the bright planet Mercury should pop into view. And then you can follow it for about 20 or 40 minutes or so until Mercury sets in the northwest. We have now a couple of photographs to show what Mercury looked like in the spring of 1988 when it was joined in the western sky after sunset by the brightest of all of the planets, Venus. In the spring of 1988, one year ago, Mercury was particularly prominent in the western sky after sunset. Here we see a photograph of Mercury taken from Muskoka. In the spring of 1988, Mercury was coupled with the brilliant planet Venus in the evening sky. On the same evening, a longer exposure shows the bright planet Venus, and below it the planet Mercury. Although Venus will not be present in the evening sky in the spring of 1989, we should enjoy spectacular views of the planet Mercury. You can read about all of these events and many other sites in the evening skies in 1989 in this publication, The Observer's Handbook, a publication of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. The Observer's Handbook is a world-renowned publication and is available in science stores throughout Ontario as well as from the Society itself on DuPont Street in Toronto. Springtime is a time not only to see the planets Jupiter, Mercury, and Mars, and the Moon in the evening sky, but also some of our favorite constellations. One of the best known, of course, is the constellation of Ursa Major, also known as the Great Bear or the Big Dipper in North America. A short five-minute photograph of the constellation Ursa Major taken from a dark site shows not only the bright stars, but also the fainter stars in the constellation. Here we see the familiar shape of Ursa Major. And here, a particularly interesting double star called Mizar and Alcor. Mizar and Alcor can actually be seen by the very keen-eyed observer as two distinct stars. In fact, the ancient Egyptians used Mizar and Alcor as a test for keen-eyed observers. It does appear distinctly double if you look very carefully. Interestingly, Mizar, which is the brighter of the two stars, itself is a very close double star. And it was, in fact, the very first double star to be discovered with the telescope in the year 1650. A small telescope can show all three components, as this diagram demonstrates. In the eyepiece in even a small telescope, the star is Mizar, seen to the lower left, and Alcor, seen to the upper right, are seen very widely separated. Indeed, the separation between the two components is about one-third the apparent diameter of the moon as seen in our sky. In the telescope as well, Mizar appears as a very close double star. The spring skies of 1989 will certainly keep us all very busy. 
Even more exciting will be the night sky this coming summer, which will feature a total lunar eclipse on the evening of Wednesday, August 16th. Astronomy Toronto has plans underway now to bring you this exciting event live. In a minute, Randy will be back with a preview of this year in space, a year of recovery. For the night sky this season, this is Michael Watson wishing you clear skies. Three years ago, 1986 was to have been a year of new space missions with spacecraft ready to travel to Jupiter and around the Sun, and a large space telescope ready to be launched into Earth orbit. It had been eight years since any new probe had flown to a planet, and the science community was desperate to get back into business. Successful Soviet, Japanese, and European unmanned probes flew to Comet Halley. The more ambitious American mission had been canceled. The space shuttle was eating up money and starving scientific missions. 1986 would put space science back on track, but the Challenger tragedy changed everyone's high hopes. It took two and a half years to get the shuttle flying again. Many payloads originally scheduled to use the shuttle have now been moved onto expendable rockets. Three key missions, however, have had to ride out the weight and in one case be partly redesigned. The Hubble Space Telescope was stored in California while scientists tried to fill a nearly three-year wait by fine-tuning the equipment and the procedures to use it. The Galileo mission to orbit Jupiter suffered the most. Its high-energy rocket booster was disqualified from use on the space shuttle and was replaced with a less powerful stage. This meant it would take four years longer to reach Jupiter, which required expensive changes to the spacecraft. Meanwhile, the Voyager probe was traveling the last leg of a tremendous 12-year odyssey to the outer planets. This year, we'll see the last flyby of this mission as Neptune comes in range of its instruments. Fortunately for astronomers and space scientists, this will not be a last gasp in our exploration of the solar system and the universe around us. This year of recovery will be kicked off in April by the launch of the Magellan spacecraft on board the space shuttle Atlantis. Named after the great explorer who was the first to sail around the world, Magellan's mission will be to map the surface of Venus by radar. The planet Venus is the Earth's sister planet. It is about the same size as the Earth and has a similar composition. It is an inner planet, which means that it orbits the Sun inside of our own orbit. Venus is easily seen with the naked eye, either shortly before dawn or shortly after dusk. Venus is often called the evening or morning star because it is extremely bright. In fact, it is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. This is due to the fact that Venus is completely covered in a dense white cloud. Every day is a cloudy day on the planet Venus. There are other ways Venus is different from the Earth. It has no moon, no water, it rotates backwards, and its day lasts 117 Earth days. Why is Venus so different in some ways and yet so similar when compared to the Earth? That is what astronomers are trying to find out. Venus has been visited by several unmanned spacecraft in the past. These spacecraft have orbited the planet and photographed the clouds, entered the atmosphere, and actually landed on its surface. These probes have told us that Venus has a rocky surface with a temperature of 900 degrees, a literal hell. The thick atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid, not a nice place to visit. Venus's geology, that is how the surface formed and how it changes, is very interesting. 
The surface of Venus is thought to be between the age of the young Earth and the extremely old moons of the solar system. So Venus might give us clues as to how an Earth-like planet evolved. Unlike Mars, where orbiting spacecraft have been able to photograph nearly the entire surface, Venus's clouds prevent mapping by photography. To see through the clouds and map the surface, radar must be used. The Magellan spacecraft will use a technique called synthetic aperture radar imaging. Radar waves beamed by the Magellan spacecraft will pass through these clouds and strike the surface. Then they'll be reflected according to the type and height of terrain they hit and return with this information to the spacecraft. These digitally processed signals will then be transmitted back to Earth. By this method, a geological map of nearly the entire planet will be made, showing objects on the planet as small as one-fifth of a kilometer in size. If the Eaton Center was on Venus, Magellan would be able to see it. The spacecraft is six meters high and weighs 3,600 kilograms. It uses a dish antenna left over from the Voyager program to communicate with Earth and obtain radar images. In the middle is the forward equipment module, which houses electronics and computer systems. Its attitude and position will be controlled by small jets arranged on struts about the spacecraft. At Venus, it will receive twice as much heat and light from the sun, so it is covered in bright white thermal blankets to keep itself at room temperature. Solar panels will provide it with power. The launch of Magellan will be NASA's 20th planetary mission and the first by the United States to another planet since 1978. Magellan is scheduled to be launched on the space shuttle Atlantis on April 28th. Once in Earth orbit, it will be slowly ejected from the payload bay. Hours later, Magellan's own upper stage, an Air Force IUS booster, will fire to send it on its 15-month journey to Venus. It will make two orbits about the sun as it matches the path of Venus. Once there, Magellan will fire a smaller rocket to put itself into a 250 by 8,000 kilometer elliptical orbit. After a few weeks of checkout, Magellan will begin its mapping mission. Every orbit, as Magellan passes close to Venus, it will point its four meter white dish towards the planet. It will beam radar waves toward the surface and pick up the reflections. All this data will be stored on tape recorders to be played back to Earth. The image taking will last 35 minutes. Magellan will then turn and point the same antenna back towards the Earth and play back the recorded data at the stunning rate of 260,000 bits of information per second. The playback takes longer, about two hours. Once it returns close to Venus, it points its antenna down again to take more radar images. Since its last image taking run, Venus has rotated enough so that the next 15 kilometer wide swath will slightly overlap the last. Each swath will contain a staggering 1,700 million bits of radar information. Eight orbits per day for 243 days will be necessary to map approximately 70% of the surface. This should last from August 1990 to April 1991. After this, Magellan can be instructed to continue its mapping run to obtain images of any missed runs or concentrate on specific objects of interest. At the end of its mission, Magellan will have mapped 90% of the surface of Venus down to a resolution of one-fifth of a kilometer. That's better than the Earth has been mapped. What do we expect to learn from Magellan? And what is it we will see on the surface of Venus? Jim Head of Brown University is on the Magellan team. Now, the last 25 years has seen an incredible array of exploration missions on the part of the United States and the Soviet Union uh, in order to try to understand what's going on. It's an experiment in trying to determine what the factors are that form uh, these planetary bodies and how they evolve. And of course, this is incredibly important to understand uh, why we are where we are on the Earth today. For example, as you're well familiar with, with the Earth's moon, we've sent humans to the surface of the moon six times, returned samples. Uh, we visited the surface of Mars uh, with a Viking spacecraft uh, built by Martin Marietta and other industry contractors. And in fact, we've uh, flown by Mercury a number of times to look at the surface there. Uh, and as John alluded to, there have been a number of missions to Venus, but really 
uh, in terms of a global picture of what's going on, the kind of thing that will permit us to look at the uh, characteristics of the planet that let us fit it into a grand scheme, we just don't have the information in hand. We have a lot of enticing types of information that point in certain directions, but we lack uh, the detailed understanding of the surface global structure to allow us to have a framework to put it all together. So in that sense, absolutely, Venus is really a missing link. It's the last uh, view of the characteristics of planets in the inner solar system as we've been building for 25 years to try to understand the basic themes of the uh, evolution of the planets uh, like the Earth. So Venus is a missing link. It's really like the final jewel in a crown. We've been working and putting this thing together, and this is it. This is the piece that will really give form and shape to uh, the whole uh, structure, this whole grand experiment that we've been looking at for the last and performing for the last 25 years. From an inner planet to the farthest out, the next big space event for 1989 comes this summer from the planet Neptune. On August 25th, the Voyager 2 spacecraft will complete a 12-year mission. Launched in 1977, the primary mission of Voyager was to travel to the planets Jupiter and Saturn. As a bonus, the spacecraft was able to survive beyond its expected lifetime to pass by the planet Uranus in 1986 and now Neptune later this year. Voyagers 1 and 2 were both launched in the fall of 1977. Both flew by Jupiter and Saturn and returned both data and excellent photographs of the planets and their systems of natural satellites or moons. In 1979, they flew by Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. The Voyagers discovered rings around the planet and gave us the first close-up looks at the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Active sulfur volcanoes were discovered on Io. The possibility of an underground ocean was discovered on Europa. A movie was made showing the circulation pattern of the Great Red Spot. This storm has been visible from the Earth for several centuries. In 1980 and 1981, the two spacecraft passed by the ringed planet Saturn. They photographed the planet the intricate and beautiful ring system, and Saturn's moons. Strange icy worlds named Titan, Dione, Rhea, Tethys, Mimas, Enceladus and Iapetus. The ring system of Saturn was a shock. Once thought to be made up of five or six rings, it turned out to be a network of thousands of individual ringlets. Many smaller moons which orbit within the rings were discovered. These so-called shepherding moons help to keep the ring structure intact. The rings of Saturn are truly one of the most beautiful sights in the solar system. Using the gravity of Saturn to redirect its trajectory and increase its velocity, Voyager 2 was targeted towards Uranus. It arrived in January 1986. As it flew by, Voyager photographed the cloud tops of the planet, its rings, which were as black as coal, and its system of moons. The most spectacular results came when it imaged the small moon Miranda. 
NASA scientists have taken the images of Miranda and created a computer-generated film showing what it would be like to fly over the moon. This is Miranda, the movie. This August, Voyager 2 will fly by the last planet in its journey, Neptune. We don't really know a lot about Neptune and its moons, Triton and Nereid. Neptune is too faint to be seen with the unaided eye. Through a moderate-sized telescope, it shows a very small bluish disk. Neptune rotates about the sun at a distance of 4 and one half billion kilometers from Earth and takes 165 years per orbit. Radio communications traveling at the speed of light will take four hours to reach Voyager. Neptune looks like the planet Uranus from Earth. It's nearly two and one-half times as big as the Earth and covered in a hazy atmosphere. It is unlikely that we will see much detail in the clouds of Neptune. There is an exciting possibility that Neptune has a system of ringlets similar to Uranus. Voyager 2 will attempt to photograph any rings and associated small moons acting as shepherds. As Voyager approaches Neptune, it will study its atmosphere, measure the energy it reflects, measure its magnetic field, if it has one, and search for lightning storms in its upper atmosphere. All this will tell us about the interior of Neptune, how long its day is, and possibly about the history of this mysterious planet. Stars will be observed as they pass behind the rings and the upper atmosphere of Neptune. The blinking out of these stars will tell scientists about the nature and structure of these objects. As well, Voyager will pass behind Neptune, out of radio contact with the Earth. It will continue to send its radio signals through the atmosphere. How much signal we receive tells us about the upper atmosphere of Neptune. The available light out at Neptune is 900 times fainter than daylight on Earth, similar to the light available during late dusk. Each photograph will require a long exposure. The Voyager spacecraft will have to slowly rotate to compensate for its motion past the planet to prevent smudging the photographs. The moon Triton is an odd moon. It travels backwards or retrograde around Neptune, and its orbit is aligned 21 degrees to the plane of Neptune's equator. As well, Triton has an atmosphere, sharing that distinction in the solar system only with Saturn's moon, Titan. Observations have shown that methane and nitrogen exist on Triton, but it is unknown if the material is solid or gaseous. Voyager could show us that Triton has a clear nitrogen atmosphere with frozen nitrogen and methane lakes or oceans. To give us a clear picture of Triton, Voyager scientists had to make a difficult decision. A close pass of Triton requires Voyager to fly over Neptune's North Pole. Originally, Voyager was to just skim above Neptune's atmosphere and pass within 10,000 kilometers of Triton. But the recently accepted possibility of rings made that trajectory dicey. Traveling at 27 kilometers per second, the impact of only a small grain of sand would destroy Voyager. A safe passage will now take the probe high above Neptune. At midnight on Friday, August 25th, 1989, Voyager 2 will pass 4,500 kilometers above Neptune's atmosphere. The big planet's gravity will then redirect Voyager and only five hours later, it will pass Triton at a distance of 40,000 kilometers. After Neptune, Voyager 2 will continue on its way out of our solar system. 
Its nuclear power generators should supply enough electricity for Voyager to remain in communication with the Earth well into the 21st century. It will continue on its journey between the stars and, who knows, may someday be discovered by other life forms in our galaxy. It will take at least 40,000 years for a Voyager to come anywhere close to another star. In the near future, Voyagers 1 and 2 will be remembered as the most successful unmanned space probes ever launched. They introduced us to the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We'll be back in just a moment to look at the Galileo mission to Jupiter and the Hubble Space Telescope. The Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei first pointed a telescope at the heavens in the year 1610. When he looked at the planet Jupiter, he noticed four star-like objects in orbit about the planet. Galileo had discovered the four largest moons of Jupiter. Today, the moons Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede are known as the Galilean moons. This November, the United States will launch an unmanned probe to the planet Jupiter named after Galileo. Unlike the Voyager spacecraft, which quickly flew through the Jupiter system, Galileo will orbit Jupiter for two years, gathering data about the planet and its moon system. It will be placed in Earth orbit by the space shuttle Atlantis and then be boosted by a rocket stage, starting a journey which began back in the mid-1970s. Galileo was originally scheduled to be launched seven years ago, but delays in the shuttle program and uncertainty about the rocket engine, which was meant to boost Galileo to Jupiter, forced delays up to 1986. Then the Challenger accident delayed the mission another three years. Originally, Galileo was to be boosted on a powerful rocket stage called Centaur. The journey to Jupiter would have taken two years. After the Challenger accident, NASA decided that it would be too dangerous to use the liquid-fueled Centaur stage in the payload bay of the space shuttle. The Centaur program was cancelled, and Galileo managers had to plan to use the solid-fueled inertial upper stage, which has been used to launch communication satellites from the space shuttle. The less powerful booster cannot send Galileo directly to Jupiter, so a complex series of planetary encounters will be needed to slingshot the probe to its final destination. Galileo will fly a Venus, Earth, Earth, Gravity Assist, or VEGA trajectory, which will take four years longer than the original plan of two years. Once deployed from the space shuttle, the inertial upper stage will boost Galileo in towards the sun for an encounter with the planet Venus. Passing by at 20,000 kilometers above Venus, the gravity will fling it out towards Jupiter. Unfortunately, the first encounter won't give it enough energy. Galileo will fall back in towards its first of two encounters with the planet Earth. In December 1990, Galileo will pass 3,600 kilometers above the Earth. The gravity of the Earth will fling Galileo out past the orbit of Mars into the asteroid belt. But still, it won't have enough energy to make it out to Jupiter. It will take two years for Galileo to return back towards the inner solar system for its second encounter with the Earth, which will take place in December 1992. Galileo will fly past the Earth at only 300 kilometers above the atmosphere. This gravity assist will give Galileo enough energy to fly out towards the planet Jupiter. This trajectory, by the way, gives us an added bonus. Because Galileo is passing two times through the asteroid belt, we have an opportunity to get our first photographs of an asteroid. The scheduled arrival time of Galileo at the planet Jupiter is November 1995. 
Because Galileo is now being sent towards the sun, instead of away from it, solar shields had to be added to the spacecraft for its journey towards Venus. Galileo is actually made up of two spacecraft. The Jupiter orbiter will orbit Jupiter and carry the communications antenna, computers, electronics, and science packages. The atmospheric entry probe is nestled underneath the orbiter. It will be released before reaching Jupiter and will be targeted to enter Jupiter's atmosphere and radio back its findings. The orbiting spacecraft is built of two main sections. One part is constantly spinning at a rate of three revolutions per minute. The spinning section will house scientific instruments which will measure the environment around Jupiter. The de-spun section provides a stable platform for the camera. Galileo's computer system is the most sophisticated ever flown on a spacecraft. It will control all the scientific equipment on board, as well as the communications and attitude control systems. The camera system consists of a high-resolution CCD, or charge couple device. It will provide images 100 times better than those returned by Voyager. Other instruments will measure the heat energy emanating from Jupiter and its moons, the composition and temperature of Jupiter's atmosphere, and the magnetic field and energetic particles in Jupiter's vicinity. Electric power to run these systems comes from a set of nuclear power generators mounted on separate five-meter booms. Before arriving at Jupiter, the atmospheric entry probe will separate from Galileo. It will measure the temperature, density, pressure, and composition as it enters Jupiter's atmosphere at the staggering speed of 48 kilometers per second. Friction will generate a temperature of 8,300 degrees Celsius on the probe's outer skin. After entry, the probe will plummet through the denser atmosphere, and a parachute will be deployed, and the probe will slowly descend. It will then transmit data to the orbiter for about an hour as it sinks deeper and deeper towards the planet. It is expected that transmission will stop as the pressures and temperatures increase and destroy the probe. Shortly afterwards, Galileo will use another gravity assist maneuver to slow down. By passing close to the inner moon Io, it will slow down enough so that by firing its rockets it will be placed into orbit about Jupiter. The two-year mission will have started. Galileo will continue to use gravity assist maneuvers to pass close to the other Galilean moons. Each moon of Jupiter is a world on its own. Galileo will pass close to Europa and photograph its surface, which looks like a cracked eggshell. It will fly by Ganymede and examine its heavily cratered surface as well as its smooth grooved terrain. When Galileo flies by Callisto, the outermost Galilean moon, it will observe a heavily cratered surface which may have remained the same over the last three and one half billion years. Each flyby of a moon will alter Galileo's trajectory, thus setting up a close flyby with another moon. The gravity assist maneuvers will also shorten Galileo's orbit time from 230 days for the first orbit to less than 90 days for later orbits. The Galileo mission will improve on what Voyager showed us about Jupiter and its moon system. It will give us more information on why the outer planets are mainly composed of gases while the inner planets are primarily made of rock. This may show us how the solar system formed over four and a half billion years ago. While Galileo, Voyager, and Magellan will tell us more about the Earth and the solar system, the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope into Earth orbit this December will provide astronomers with a means of finding out more about the rest of the universe. Placing a large telescope in Earth orbit has been the dream of astronomers ever since the first artificial satellites were launched in the 1950s. Several smaller telescopes have been launched, but none were as large as the Hubble Space Telescope. 
The telescope is named after the American astronomer Edwin P. Hubble. He determined that the universe is made up of island star systems or galaxies and that the universe is expanding. By observing the light emitted by distant galaxies, he was able to determine that all the galaxies are receding from our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The main component of the Hubble telescope is its 2.4 meter mirror. This is not the largest telescope ever made by any means, but it will be the largest placed in Earth orbit. When launched by the space shuttle, the Hubble telescope will just barely fit into the payload bay. Once in orbit, the 11,500 kilogram telescope will be precisely pointed using a set of fine guidance sensors. The starlight collected by the mirror will be directed to a set of five instruments. Two cameras will record what the telescope sees. A photometer will measure the amount of light received from an object. The spectrograph will spread the light out into different wavelengths to determine the composition of the object emitting the light. The other components of the telescope are the heaters, gyroscopes to position and point the telescope, electronics, computers, and communication equipment to relay data to Earth and receive instructions. A set of solar arrays will generate the 4,000 watts necessary to power the electronics. After deployment in a 500 kilometer orbit above the Earth this December, the telescope will go through a six month checkout period to evaluate the performance of its instrument package. Then it will begin what should be a 20 year mission of 24 hour a day observing. Control of the telescope will be from the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. From time to time, a shuttle mission will visit the telescope for routine maintenance and occasionally to upgrade the instrument package. While in orbit, the telescope cannot be pointed towards the sun, earth, or moon. The bright light would damage the sensitive instruments. Data from Hubble will be transmitted to Earth by two high gain antennas via the array of tracking and data relay satellites recently deployed by the space shuttle. Why spend over a billion dollars to put a telescope into Earth orbit? Telescopes on Earth are always battling the atmosphere. The ocean of air blurs the images, restricting the usefulness of most observatory-sized telescopes. Cloudy weather, air and light pollution all hamper astronomical observations. A telescope in Earth orbit can be used 24 hours a day. The Hubble telescope will give astronomers the ability to see objects 10 times better than on the Earth. For example, if the Hubble telescope was in Toronto, it could pick out a Canadian loony situated in New York City, about 760 kilometers away. It will be able to see objects that are 50 times fainter and 7 times further into space, and hence explore a volume of space 350 times larger than the largest ground-based telescope can see. As well, Hubble will be able to observe light in different frequencies, from the ultraviolet to the infrared. These frequencies of light are absorbed by the Earth's upper atmosphere and never reach telescopes on the ground. The Hubble Space Telescope will look farther out in the universe and with that look back into time. If we can see objects which are 15 billion light years away, we will be seeing them as they appeared at the time of the creation of the universe. Certainly the Hubble Space Telescope will have a major impact on our understanding of the universe. It may very well revolutionize many preconceived ideas we have in astronomy. Astronomers from all over the world have submitted observation programs to be carried out using the HST. There are many fundamental questions in astronomy which this telescope will help to answer. What is the age of the universe? How much mass is there in the universe? Hubble will observe strange objects like quasars, black holes, supernovae, and exploding galaxies. It will be able to detect planets orbiting nearby stars. Some observations will help tell how fast all the galaxies are moving away from each other. There will certainly be unexpected discoveries that will change our outlook on the universe. So what lies ahead after 1989? Plans are underway to send more unmanned space probes to the planets. Mars probes will orbit the planet and photograph its surface in high detail. Someday, a Mars sample return mission will land on the surface, as did the Viking probes in 1976. 
However, these new Mars landers will consist of rovers which will travel across the Mars landscape. Then, after studying the surface and collecting samples of Mars material, blast off for a return to Earth. We will then have our first pieces of Mars to study. Other space telescopes are currently being built to observe light in the high energy spectrum, like gamma rays and cosmic rays. This year will be the beginning of several exciting decades of space exploration. Well, that's all the time we have for Astronomy Toronto. I would like to remind our viewers that International Astronomy Day will be taking place on Saturday, May 13th. For more information, see Terence Dickinson's column, The Universe, in the Saturday Star. On the next show, we'll include a preview of the total lunar eclipse, which will be taking place this August. And we will have a retrospective on the 20th anniversary of the first moon landing. Thanks go to Tim Turnbull and Michael Watson for appearing on the show. And I'd like to thank you for watching Astronomy Toronto.